<laughs> Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. I didn't quite get my my signal to start. <laughs> my my helpers in the background are are smiling big right now. Hey, we are super excited to have you this evening. Uh, Pastor Kim Wilcox, North Baptist Church, we invite you to the table this evening. And as we invite you to the table this evening, we uh, encourage you to uh, share this on your Facebook page. I allow others to take part in uh, the Bible study this evening. We're going to talk about redemption this evening. And uh, uh, so anyway, we we encourage you to uh, to share this, to, to be a part, uh, see what God is doing, not only uh, in in our lives here, but how that reflects into your life as well. And then from there, see how that is working uh, in your world as you come together. So, um just got a couple of announcements this evening. We are going to do the food pantry at Pomona tomorrow from 1 to 4. Uh, food pantry at North on Tuesday from 1 to 4. Uh, Sunday morning we are live again at uh, North Baptist Church at 1030. Uh, we're going to be uh, Facebook live and in-person live both at 1030. No, no videos prior so uh, we'll be up and going. This Sunday uh, we're going to do things a little bit in advance this year. Lots of times we we miss a lot of the things that transpire the week between Palm Sunday and uh, Resurrection Sunday. So this Sunday at North, we're going to be talking about uh, Palm Sunday and what took place then. So then the following Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, we can really kind of take a look at the, the week before. So that's where we're headed with that this evening. Uh, with that, we're going to uh, pray uh, for uh, our nation, for our Bible study this evening. Uh, we're going to lift up uh, God's direction uh, for each one of us as well. So with that this morning and this evening, if you would join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for an opportunity to gather. And we thank you for the technology that allows us to take place. And, and Lord, we even pray that... Uh, uh, as it goes through these airwaves, Lord, that there will be some that can uh, hear this message of, of Jesus. Uh, maybe for the first time, maybe for the for multiple times, uh, Lord. But whoever it is uh, that's able to hear, Lord, we pray that you would uh, minister to them. Uh, Lord, we know that your word is active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, we know that, uh, that through your word that it as it's proclaimed that it does not come back void. Uh, so, Lord, we pray for the hearts of those that are uh, online this evening. Uh, pray for the hearts of those who will hear this message in the weeks to come. And, Lord, may you uh, truly receive the glory and honor, and may you, through your Holy Spirit, minister to uh, each one right where they are that would help draw them closer to you. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We we'll give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to get started this evening. Uh, really, as you have read through, hopefully you're kind of looking at the daily devotions that pop up on the Facebook page. Uh, it correlates with that calendar that we sent out earlier in the month. Uh, there's some questions there that you can kind of come alongside and answer those questions. And that's going to be kind of a part of what we're doing in Bible study uh, this evening. And so that will give you a heads up in that direction. Um, we, we're going to talk about redemption uh, this evening. Uh, redemption comes through uh, Jesus, uh, through uh, his death, bloodshed, his uh, burial and resurrection. Uh, we see those things. I'm going to use that word uh, maybe uh, once, hopefully not more than that this evening when I say uh, Easter. Uh, I don't like to use that word. It's so commercialized uh, anymore that I don't like to, to use it. Uh, I like to say Resurrection Sunday, but uh, you might be familiar with the term Easter. And uh, uh, hopefully this evening you've heard about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, his sacrifice for the, for the sins of mankind, and then how he rose from the dead three days later. And so if you had to pick and choose maybe the, uh, the most important headline pieces, if you were to write the story for the newspaper, uh, those would be crucial elements for that day's uh, edition of the news. Kind of uh, really uh, a connecting piece then for for Christianity and for our, for our faith today. And so in this uh, first week, we're going to work each week as we head towards the resurrection, uh, talk about redemption this week, uh, Palm Sunday the next week, 
some of the activities that took place uh, that week between Palm Sunday and then Resurrection Sunday. And then, uh, spoiler alert, yes, Jesus is alive, right? And so on April 9th, we're going to talk about uh, Jesus' resurrection and the hope that we really find in that. And so as we looked for this first week's, uh, last week's session, uh, if you did not uh, join that, I'd encourage you to look back and take a look at that. Uh, it really walked through each day some of the things that took place uh, from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday, some of the things and scripturally what went on. Uh, so we encourage you to kind of look at that, to, to see those things, hear that. Uh, really, I, I really hope that in, in some way this, this season of the resurrection can be uh, a, a greater season for you, that you really uh, seek God's guidance, his direction uh, for uh, yourself uh, for this year, as well as those around you. That's what we're really going to kind of uh, focus on as we go. And so we're going to look a little deeper this year into those things, into those those highlights of those things that, that took place <clears throat> really in the in that last week of, of Jesus' life. Uh, we, we journeyed back to the Old Testament. Uh, we kind of talked about that Sunday in Genesis chapter 3 uh, up to Genesis chapter 22. And we're going to see how God spoke uh, to so many different people as he moved forward with this with this plan of redemption. And again, I want to I want to stress from the right at the very beginning here that uh, Jesus coming to earth and his death and resurrection, that was not plan B. That was never plan B. Uh, before God even created the world, he knew that mankind was going to uh, be disobedient, uh, be sinful, and that he would have to have a plan in effect already to be able to redeem mankind. And that's what uh, he had the plan made uh, before the creation, and Jesus is the fulfillment of that with his life and death and, and resurrection. If you uh, have been trying to get on our webpage recently, uh, it had a, a huge major update and took some really uh, struggling to get along. It, it happened about the 1st of February. Finally, today, we're able to get things up and going again, so the, the past messages are on the web page now. If your friends don't have Facebook, um, uh, you can check out the web page anyway, ottawanbc.org. It allows you to uh, see some of the things that are going on, our calendar of events, and some different things, but it's it's up and going as well. Uh, so that allows others to take part in the ministries do that. And so as we talk about Jesus' uh, earthly life, his, his death, uh, the resurrection, uh, the ministry that he had, uh, we see Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was to save us from our sin. And again, that wasn't a plan that came into effect after Adam and Eve were disobedient in the garden. Uh, it was one that was already in place before the garden was even created. In that dark day uh, that we think of Jesus' death at Golgotha, that was planned from the very beginning of time. In the early in Scripture, we we see the the seeds of of hope, the seeds that that God is planting in those around us, uh, the ones that He wants us to see, the ones He wants us to to grasp, and he started to cast these these visions, this, this shadow, if you will, of the Messiah that was to come. Now, I know that uh, for us, we have the, the benefit of looking back at the Old Testament and going through the New, and lots of times it's easy for us to say, man, how did they not see that? Uh, well, because they were they were living it at the time, and so that's a that's a huge difference. We see things from from this side of the cross. We see things from this side of the resurrection, and so we know then who Jesus is, who Jesus was, how he loved, how he acted, how he sacrificed, how he how he spoke to those that uh, came to hear him, how he how he healed those that came around, how he led with a servant's heart. 
And so it's a lot easier for us to see today how, how Jesus really filled in those gaps, filled in those holes that were there from the, uh, the prophecies from the Old Testament. Uh, we can see, oh yeah, that, that really does make sense. But we live in a world today where a lot of people still don't understand. They still don't know Jesus. They might know of Jesus. They might have heard something about him, but they don't know him personally. And so we also have brothers and sisters of ours that, that lived in the Old Testament that looked through like a telescope, uh, looking out to a time when the Messiah would come. And God is putting these pieces together. If you ever played that game, uh, Blockus, uh, it's a game that has lots of little pieces that are all shaped in different shapes and their sizes and they have different angles and you try to piece them all together and the last one that places the piece wins. Well, that's not, you don't win with this, but that's kind of God is placing those pieces together as we move through that Old Testament on into the New Testament. It's easy, again, for us to see those things together. Uh, today. Now, in the Old Testament, they received hope from the prophecies. They would have a prophet come on scene and God would speak to them. And as God spoke to them, uh, he would uh, enable them to, to hear some things that would happen in the future, things that would take place um, years in advance. And yet, those things came to play and came into being then then through Jesus. And so they saw, as the time went, as history continued to g go there, uh, God placed those things together, and it became clearer and clearer as those things took place. And now today we think about, uh, it's amazing to think how all those things took place, how all those prophecies were fulfilled, and so so one individual man could not do that had it not been Jesus, fully God and fully man at the same time. To be able to take those pieces and, and place them together, God initiated those things. And so then almost immediately after Adam and Eve uh, chose what to do what was right in their own eyes, which was disobedience to God, we hear the promise of the Redeemer coming. Uh, in Genesis 3.15, we see that he would be the one that would crush the serpent's head. And so God continues to point to the coming of Jesus through the Exodus story as they were delivered from Egypt. They delivered and then began the, the Passover and the sacrifice with the lamb. God continues to tell about this coming of the Messiah who would appear as a, as a servant. Humbly coming and serving and then suffering all to help us. And today now as we look back at the cross, we can't help with to be struck with just the intentionality that, that God did and, and took place as as these things unfolded as he as he put this plan into action to offer redemption for mankind uh, a rescue if you will and so he had his wayward his helpless people uh, from the very beginning uh, but God continued to uh, if you can see our candle this evening he illuminated the way right he illuminated their their footsteps along the paths and allowed them to continue to to follow him. And that's still there and available for us today. Uh, we use it through his word, through, uh, through prayer, through circumstances, through the church, as we see God continuing to move. And so he illuminated those steps so that we could gain and, and have a better understanding of, of not only who Jesus is, but what God wants for each one of us. And so in, in these next uh, several weeks, we're going to look at those very specific things as we move through the, the season of uh, the final week of Jesus' life and, 
really we're going to see the, the light that really shines, the light that comes, is the light of the Messiah, right? Jesus Christ. And so as we begin this evening, uh, as we did in, in Monday's daily devotion there on, on Facebook that you saw, uh, you know, what, what are some of your favorite traditions from uh, the resurrection season? Uh, how did you celebrate it growing up? Um, I said one of the things that I remember uh, specifically, and my kids kind of remember that too, but is uh, my parents went to uh, sunrise service every year. I remember cold, I remember snow, I remember warm, I remember rain. I remember one time it was so cold that uh, as a kid, nobody even got out of their cars. They just kind of pulled up and uh, it was just bitterly cold that morning and the preacher got out and that might have been his shortest message ever. Uh, <laughs> and he was talking to, to carloads of people that were still in their cars. And uh, uh, But... It doesn't matter really if it's cold or rainy or, or snowy or, or beautiful. Uh, the celebration is because Jesus rose from the dead. And so that's where we find hope. And so you might bring those traditions along with you as you grow but, uh, and as you age, but, but how do you celebrate today? How do you celebrate the resurrection of, of Jesus? Now, sometimes as we as we grow and age and grow in our maturity, uh, we kind of become numb to the story. We've heard it so many times that we miss a lot of the, the most powerful aspects of what really had taken place. And so my goal, my desire for you this year is that you are able to uh, experience this resurrection afresh, anew this year. Uh, maybe not like you've never heard it before because you, you have heard it. But my desire for you is that you would really seek God's guidance and direction this year, that he would be able to reveal to you uh, the purpose of what it is and, and why is, why we still celebrate it today. And then I want you to think of of someone, you know, that's been kind of our theme uh, for the last uh, several days at North. We've been trying to... Uh, pray for our neighbor, visit our neighbor. And so I want you to think of somebody that you might know that doesn't know Jesus. Now they might uh, know who he is, they might know to a point, but not really knowing who he is. And then think, do they think that their situation without Jesus is, is hopeless? more than likely they would say no. Without a full understanding of the beginning of those scriptures to see that there is a need for a Savior, that we're really not good, we don't have good intentions, we don't have good desires, then we're not going to really understand the, the depth of redemption that comes from Jesus. And so my desire for you is that you would really have an intentional sense to know uh, what do you hope to get out of these next four weeks? That you really just don't jump on the Bible study and, and be a, a part of it, but that you would really want to know what what can this Jesus do for me? What, what can God uh, bring about in my life today uh, in a sense that would be a greater understanding of him, of, of who he is, what he's doing. And so that's what we want to see through this season. And so I'd really encourage you to, to pray, to uh, ask God to help you walk through these next four weeks, this next season, with uh, some new eyes, right? You can wear my glasses here for the next four weeks, maybe. Uh, with, uh, with a teachable heart. Uh, the only way we can really come to a greater understanding is with a teachable heart. Uh, we can't come into this thinking, I know everything, I've already heard all these stories before, uh, I, there's not really much, Pastor, that you can teach me that I don't already know. And that might be true, but God can bring you into a lot deeper relationship with himself if you ask for that. And then also pray for somebody that you know that might not know uh 
Jesus in a, in a great way. Uh, maybe they're not living for Jesus, whatever that might be. And pray for their heart to be open to the gospel, that they, they would hear, and they would take an opportunity to, uh, to be a part of this. And so as we begin, uh, like I said, I would encourage you to kind of follow the, the Facebook page uh, to see the messages uh, that are there on the Daily Devotions so you can read these so you kind of have an understanding of, of where we are. Because uh, like this evening, we're going to start off in Genesis 3. We're not going to read all that. Uh, we looked at it Sunday. Uh, you had an opportunity to on Monday. And so really, uh, if you'll read these and kind of look as we go, it, it's going to make a whole lot of sense to you as we come to the Bible study evenings. And so then that makes me think this evening, have you ever tried to uh, diet? Have you ever tried to exercise to lose weight? And probably several of you can raise your hand and say, oh yeah, New Year's resolution, right? That's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to exercise, I'm going to diet, I'm going to lose weight. And by January 3rd, we're right back to where we were at the very beginning, right? They usually don't, they usually don't last. And really, they don't last because we really don't have that desire, that intentionality to really make that take place. And so we try all kinds of different things. We try all kinds of fads. We all try all kinds of diets. Somebody will say, well, this one worked for me. This one works for me. And, and so it'll work for you. And, and maybe you should buy my book, right, on how to do it. And people sell books right and left on how to diet. But until it becomes intentionally in our hearts and our minds, it's, it's just not going to take place. Uh, you can take all kinds of vitamins. You can have all kinds of, of those uh, powders and, and mix things that you add, before, add with water to take before your meals or, or whatever those things. You can create great meal plans. Uh, you can reorganize your schedule then to, to work out. But every year, there are millions and millions of dollars that are spent on uh, things that can help us do what really only we can do ourselves. And so I'm sure you understand right where we're at as we begin this evening. Now, some of those advertisements that you see on TV uh, for weight loss products or, or these things, uh, just so you know, a lot of them are um, exaggerated, right? Some of them might even be false information. Now, there might be a little bit of truth mixed in there, so they can say some of the things they do, but for the most part, there's not a lot of truth in that. And so that gives in to ourselves then with the temptation to to buy this product or be a part of it because we heard a little bit of truth. And so that's where our focus begins on this resurrection season. We begin with the temptation and the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Sin entered the world, and at that point it became hopeless. Now, the great thing about it is that it didn't catch God off guard. He already, he already knew. And so when he's asking Adam, you know, where are you? Uh, he already knew where Adam was. He wanted Adam to know where Adam was. And he already had that plan crafted uh, before the foundation of the world that the hope was going to be Jesus. And so as you open up your Bible this evening and you had Genesis 1-1 as a, a verse, in Genesis 1-1 it says, In the beginning, God. Now I love the way that starts because that's, that's it. Before anything else was, God is. God was. And so our focus then needs to be on the foundation of, of God. It didn't take long. Genesis chapter 3. We see the account of Adam and Eve. And they're being tempted by the deceiver. To go against. What they heard was wrong. What they thought was wrong. But he deceived them in such a way. That it made it seem like. It was okay. 
And so most of us are pretty familiar with the, the beginning and how it began beautiful. And then seemed to end in, in tragedy by Genesis chapter 3. And so Adam and Eve, they, they sinned by eating from the one and only tree that God had forbidden them to eat from. And then as Genesis 3 unfolds, we see God's, uh, the curses, the repercussion, the consequences of sin, beginning with the enemy, the serpent, to Eve and then to Adam. And so we, we see the description of what took place after the fall. And so ultimately, the, the consequence for sin is death, right? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And so it's, it's both physically and spiritually. And this death means eternal separation from God is the result for, for sin. But God in his goodness, God in his love, has this master plan from the beginning to provide a redeemer to pay for your sin, to buy you back out of slavery and deliver you into freedom. And so that's where we see the the foreshadow in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he says that uh, uh, this, this Messiah, this Savior, this Redeemer was going to crush the head of the enemy. It's really the beginning of, of the gospel that we talk about when we come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We see there's at first, this deception that comes through the enemy to Eve, and so there's some hostility that arises there. And it represents the spiritual battle that continues on even till today. You say, well, Pastor, those things took place several thousand years ago, and yes, I agree, but because of what took place then, the DNA of that sin is evident in us today. And because of, because of Adam's sin, then, we're, we're all enslaved to sin. We're dead to sin. And you say, well, Pastor, I look pretty good, but I look in the mirror, I don't think I'm dead. But yet, we are. And what we want to do, as Scripture says, we want to, we want to carry out the inclinations of our flesh. By nature, we're children living under wrath. In other words... We have no hope of our own and in ourselves. But God told the serpent that there was one coming, one from this woman's offspring, <clears throat> who would strike his head. And to strike or to crush the head of the snake was the picture that would be fatal, right? Uh, it was the final destruction of the enemy. And that's what happened with, with Jesus' coming. He came to be the perfect sacrifice. Jesus defeated death. He defeated the grave. And he defeated Satan. And even in physical death, we can have spiritual victory and have eternal life because of the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ and because of his death and resurrection. And since all humanity came from Abbott, from Adam, and see, this has got to be key for us to understand this evening. All humanity came from Adam. And because of that, we're subject to the same consequences that Adam, that God initiated to him. Physical and spiritual death, which is the punishment for sin. Paul said in Romans 3.23, all of us are sinners. There's, there's not one righteous other than Jesus. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And if, if salvation and forgiveness depends on our goodness or on our effort, we're not getting saved. 
We're going to drown in a sea of sin. Now we can wish that we were different than we are, but we don't have the power to change on our own. And so the separation that started back in the Garden of Eden was only able to be closed by the offspring then of the woman. Jesus then, this this God-man, in John we see that it's God incarnate, born of a virgin, is the shadow of what Genesis 3.15 is speaking of. And he became the light of the world. The light of the world is Jesus Christ. Because of his death on the cross, we can be made alive again and experience eternal life with God in heaven. You know, John 3.16, you know, for God to love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever, that's for you and I today, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And though 17, sometimes we we just stop there and think how good 16 is, but 17 really goes on to say that that uh, he, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. We condemn ourselves, really, by not accepting what Jesus has done for us. He, he didn't come in to condemn the world. He came to save the world. He came to save us from our sins. And so then that goes back to the question I asked you in the beginning. Why do you celebrate this holiday? Why do you celebrate the resurrection? You might call it Easter. I call it resurrection. Why do you celebrate that? Is it because spring is here, the Easter bunny and the eggs are all happy, and and so that's what you do? Or do you celebrate this holiday for what it really is because the Messiah has risen from the dead and is now offering hope to a hopeless world? And so that's the importance of, you know, we can have some traditions, we can have some neat things that we do with the family or whatever it is, But we need to be reminded of what this holiday is really about. It's really about Jesus' death, his burial, and then, of course, on that Sunday that we celebrate April 9th this year, his resurrection. Proof that God accepted the sacrifice that he gave for you and I, for our sins, that it's in Jesus that we find hope. So we know then that there's a a great, a a sovereign God, and we answer to him. It's he who we answer to. But unfortunately, we still rebel, we still mess up, we still do things, and sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's unintentional. But no matter what it is, it's still called sin. Now, we understand what we should do, but we continue to fail, and it should be apparent to us that as we make these mistakes, God's grace is still sufficient to cover us. Well, Pastor, you make us sound hopeless. Well, on our part, it is. But the great news I've got for you this evening is that it's not hopeless because in God, through Christ Jesus, there is hope. We are lost, but we're not hopeless because we've been found because Jesus has came to provide a way to give us light to the place that we can find that real hope. What we could not do on our own, Jesus has done for us. Now that's not automatic. Just because Jesus did what he did, doesn't mean that you automatically receive that. It means you come to an understanding and knowledge that Scripture said that you are a sinner. And in your own, that it's hopeless to get to God. You can't put those blocks together to make them fit and connect in a way that can bring you to God. But Jesus is the block that is the connecting piece. And so we come to the point of of accepting what he's done, 
believing that by faith, trusting him for salvation, and receiving eternal life through him. So even after what Adam and Eve did, even whether they even after they rebelled and were disobedient to God, he continues to seek after even you and I, after all these generations have taken place. And he wants us to rise up to him. And to do that, he came down to us so that he could identify with his creation so that then his creation, you and I, can identify with him. He's not a God that just sets off some far off place that uh, orchestrates things and, and manipulates us like puppets. He wants us to desire, come after and follow him. If Genesis chapter 3 didn't happen, we wouldn't need a savior. But it wasn't plan B, it was plan A all the time. Now, a lot of times we associate uh, different meals with different celebrations. Maybe for you, it's uh, turkey and stuffing and cranberry sauce at Thanksgiving. Maybe that's at Christmas. Uh, maybe cinnamon rolls on Christmas morning. Our house on resurrection morning, we have resurrection eggs. There ain't no cinnamon rolls that rolls, sorry. Yeah, I got the I got the look. <laughs> Resurrection rolls, which is like a cinnamon roll. There's nothing better than that. Maybe you have, you know, even hot dogs and and different things for Fourth of July, right? Hamburgers. Now when the Israelites left Egypt after four hundred and thirty years of slavery, God used Moses to be a part of the, the delivery at that point. The meal that was established was the Passover. The meal consisted of, of roasted lamb, bitter herbs, and leavened bread. Now, it doesn't sound super appetizing, right? But it really, in God's purpose and plan in this, was for this special meal was to be history and beyond. And so as we think about the Passover story, we need to rewind back to that, that book of Genesis, right? God made a covenant with Abraham, well, Abram, soon to be Abraham, and God promised to make Abraham's descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. But he also said that they would be slaves in a foreign land. They fast forward, right, through the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The growth of the Israelite nation. Jacob's oldest son, or older sons, sold their brother Joseph into slavery, which is then became Egypt when he relocated to there. And God's favor was, was rested upon Joseph. Joseph rose into power and, and status with the Egyptians. A famine occurred during that time. Joseph had understood it and received it, and as he did, he had already prepared and they had stored grain for this coming famine. Jacob's family was in dire need of food, and lo and behold, they come together to Egypt and they find Joseph in charge. And so as the family is reconciled under Joseph's status there in Egypt, they're able to grow and their numbers continue to increase. But then after Joseph's death, all those things changed. The Pharaoh realized that the numbers of the Israelites were multiplying, and he was worried that someday they might be able to just take over his own kingdom. And so he put them and forced them into slavery. 
And so this fulfillment of God's word to Abraham was already beginning at that point where the Israelites were, were, were growing in numbers. But as he had already told them, there would be an oppression for 400 years. But God did not forget his promise. The Israelites groaned and they moaned and they called out to God because of their difficult labor and their forced labor and their living conditions and they cried out to God and those cries ascended to heaven and God heard their cries. He heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so they, that, that use of remembered doesn't mean that God forgot because God doesn't forget. But it has now rose to a place of honor where it was to be. And so that makes me wonder, have you ever felt forgotten by God? Have things in your world became so uh, despairing that it just seems like there's uh, no hope? And I want you to think about the circumstances that were taking place at that point in time. And then be assured, though, that as the Israelites were struggling, as the Israelites were in oppression, as they were uh, being forced labor and forced to be slaves, God called Moses to be a deliverer for the Israelites, to to free them from the Pharaoh. Now the Pharaoh didn't want to allow that to take place. He refused to grant it. And in nine plagues then ravaged Egypt. And after each plague, the Pharaoh's heart got colder and harder and colder and harder and he further oppressed and forced the Israelites into even harder labor. But the scripture details in Exodus 11 the the final plague, the tenth and final plague, and in Exodus 11 it was about the death of the firstborn. And so God had a plan for the Israelites. And so to prepare the Israelites for this For this 10th plague in Egypt, where the destroyer, the the death angel then would come in and invade Egypt, God instituted the Passover. Each Israelite household was to select a one-year-old lamb or goat, if the family was small. And if they were so small, they could combine to a neighboring family and they could come together and and share the meal. The most important detail of the animal was that the animal had to be perfect. Spotless, unblemished. And God instructed them then to slaughter the lamb and spread its blood over the, the, the doorpost, the top, and the sides of the door. And then the roast of meat over the fire. And they were to eat that meat with with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. It just kind of showed them that they didn't have time to put yeast into the bread to where it had time to rise. This was going to be a, a quick thing that was going to take place. And God instructed them also to be ready, dressed to travel at a moment's notice. At the time when things took place, they had to be ready to go. And so that really doesn't change a lot in our lives today. It really needs to be, (coughs) in a sense, we need to be ready when God calls us to move in a direction. And their obedience to these instructions showed their faith. And it showed their trust in him, even though at the point in time they were still in bondage. Now consider the difficult times in your life. Have you acted in faith at times, not knowing the outcome, not knowing where you were going, not knowing what God was doing, but you trusted that God was going to do something even in the midst of, of uncertainty? 
And if you have, I know you can sit here this evening and say, I, I grew during that time. My faith grew. And it grew because you, you trusted God by faith, even though you didn't know the outcome. And so that night then, the, the lamb's blood on the doorpost and the lentils, the, the sides, set apart and protected the Israelites. But if that blood was not on those doorposts and lentils, then the death of the firstborn impacted that home in Egypt. And so in their fear then, the Pharaoh and the Egyptians immediately sent out to the Israelites. And in Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, says, And the Lord gave the people such favor with the Egyptians that they gave them what they requested. And in this way, they plundered the Egyptians. And so that verse reveals the fulfillment back in Genesis 15, 14. Here it is. The Israelites were free. And they left Egypt with possessions that were not even their own. Just as God had promised Abraham. Now think about those Israelites. Think about what they were experiencing. Think about what they thought when they left Egypt. Oh my! God not only delivered us, but he delivered us in such a way that we were able to have and take things that were not even ours. And so have you ever experienced those type of provisions from, from God? Now God called the Israelites then annually to celebrate the Passover as a reminder of what took place that night. In Exodus 12, 27, it says that he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and he spared their homes. The blood of the lamb marked the Israelites as God's people and it spared them from the death of their firstborn. The herb symbolized the bitterness of slavery. And the unleavened bread signified that they had to leave in haste, that they had to go right then. There wasn't time to wait on the bread to rise, but they were to, to leave. And so year after year, they were to eat this meal and, and be reminded of how God had delivered his people. Now in the New Testament, you fast forward to Luke, <clears throat> the Gospel of Luke, he reveals that Jesus' family had even traveled to Jerusalem annually for the Passover. One of the few stories in Scripture about Jesus' childhood happens during the event in Luke chapter 2, 41 to 50. But maybe the most important, significant Passover occurred when Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples shortly before his arrest and trial and crucifixion and death. And so over a thousand years after the first Passover, Jesus ate that same meal hours before he died on the cross with his disciples. He ate that meal with them. And he gave it a new meaning. He now called it the Lord's Supper. And so you've probably heard the phrase, Scripture can never mean what it never meant. And so long before the Israelite nation grew and became enslaved in Egypt, God already had a plan. It wasn't a plan B. It was plan A to rescue them. And that rescue came from the, the blood from the lamb that had been slain. And so Passover then had a, had a special purpose for the Israelites. It foreshadowed something far greater that was going to take place. 
And so just as God had a plan to free the Israelites from death and slavery and oppression, God has a plan to free us in the same way. And so while the Lamb's blood had saved the Israelites from physical death and led to their freedom from their Egyptian captors, Jesus' blood sacrificed on the cross saves us from spiritual death, from the oppression of sin. He died in our place and he took upon himself our punishment. The wages of sin is death. And what we deserve is death. But instead what Jesus offers us is freedom from sin. Freedom from death. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Scripture says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. From the moment sin entered the world, God had a plan to redeem us. You have never been overlooked. You have never been forgotten. God did not leave you helpless or hopeless. And he doesn't leave you in bondage to sin. Instead, he sent us his son Jesus, who was our Passover lamb. So this evening, we're going to kind of close out there. I encourage you to continue to follow through on the on the Facebook page on each day's daily devotion. Uh, follow through with that. Really ask the Lord. I really would encourage you to ask him to uh, provide a new set of eyes for you and a teachable heart through this season as we move through for the, uh, the resurrection where we celebrate. Jesus' victory over death and sin in the grave. And he did that for you. And maybe you've never really accepted that. Maybe you've never really understood that before. Maybe tonight's the first time. And if so, uh, praise the Lord for that, for that working in you. Thank him for the way he works in your life, even if it's uncertain. And again, as I said Sunday morning, I don't know what's going on in your world today. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what's taking place. I know there's lots of things that go on in each one of our lives, but I want you to know this evening that you can trust God's plan. You can trust his purpose for you because of Jesus. And whatever is going on in your world today, I would just use it as an opportunity to think, what's God wanting to do as he gets my attention? Remember, Jesus overcame sin and death, and he took our place. And so if there's areas that are in our lives, in your life, where you're struggling to uh, rest in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, ask God through this next four weeks to really deepen your faith to allow you to trust him even more. And so we're going to close out there this evening. I'm thankful for you guys joining us this evening. I encourage you to share this on your page and really invite others to take take part as we as we move through this season. And really, I, I encourage you to to pray for a, an opportunity for God to speak to you through this time, whether it's through the Word, the Bible study, through your circumstances, through prayer. And by faith, you would just trust Him as you move forward in this season of time and, and knowing that... Uh, He's not leaving you helpless. He's not leaving you alone. Scripture said, I would never leave you nor forsake you. Again, next week, we're going to begin with Palm Sunday. We're going to talk about how Passion Week begins. Uh, last Wednesday night session, if you weren't able to, to be there, was uh, a walkthrough on each one of the days as it went through. And so as we move forward, this is really a great time for you to grow in your relationship with the Lord. I fully believe 
that if we release those things to him, he can really uh, deliver us from some things that are holding us back. And that by faith, he wants to lead us into a place that we've never been. Now, that's not Pastor Kim saying. That's, that's what God's word tells us. So, Cindy, we're going to close off with that. Uh, we always thank you for the opportunity to uh, to take part in the ministries. You can do that through Generosity by Lifeway. Uh, you can download that app on your phone, PC, or tablet. Uh, you can give securely and, and privately through that. You can track your giving. Uh, you can help with the ministries that we're a part of, the missions. You can mail a check to the church, put attention, lend on it, on the envelope, and it'll get there the same place. Or you can come and join us in person, drop it in the offering plate any Sunday morning. We would love to have you come and, come and join us. Our hope and our desire is that through this season of time, these next four weeks, that you will grow in your relationship with the Lord and you will be... Uh, your eyes will be open to maybe some things that you've never never seen before. So with that this evening, we're going to close out of here. Uh, I'll see you at the food pantry tomorrow at 1 or maybe Sunday morning at 1030, uh, wherever it leads us. Uh, I hope our paths continue to cross. So love you guys. Have a great evening. Good night.